we were just barely ahead of the players, right? We we weren't even sure if we could go to bed because they might be to the next phase and there'd be nothing there, right? right. <laughs> so they um, accidentally step into the void. <laughs> so yeah, no, we didn't want to make people mad. I'm Tor Bear from Enigma. Welcome to Decentralize This. Hello, hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Decentralize This, presented by Enigma. As I said before, I'm Tor Bear, head of growth for Enigma, and today I am super thrilled to have on Marguerite de Corcel. Marguerite's the CEO and co-founder of Blockade Games, where she's helping design and build games that integrate blockchain as well as alternate reality components. So their first game is called Neon District, which I've seen pieces of, and it looks amazing. It's probably best described as an RPG set in a futuristic tech noir landscape. And if that doesn't excite you, then I don't know what to say. Uh, Marguerite is also known as Coin Artist, which is her Twitter handle. And it's also a good description of what she's known for in the blockchain space, as she's created multiple incredible works of art that hide their own secrets, such as Bitcoin wallet private keys, for example. So we're going to talk about Marguerite's history designing puzzles and creating art, the role of games in driving blockchain adoption, the importance of collaboration, and how artists can and will contribute to building the future of decentralization. Marguerite has done and built so much, and I hope this conversation is as entertaining and eye-opening for you as it was for me. So without any further introduction, here is Marguerite de Corcel. Marguerite, aka Coin Artist, thank you so much for joining us on this, what is now the fourth episode of Decentralize This. Hey, thanks for having me. So I've personally been looking forward to this conversation a lot, because uh, I think you're very different than the people we've had on so far. Uh, I think we've had a lot of like finance stuff so far. Which is great, um, but a little too consistent. And I think that you've got a totally different perspective on decentralization, on the potential of blockchain. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I got a hundred to ten thousand things I want to ask. We're probably going to keep it to like five to ten. But first of all, uh, who are you, professionally, personally? Uh, who is Marguerite Coin Artist? Uh, yeah, thanks. So I think most people in the space know me as coin artist on, um, you know, from my Twitter account or whatever. And I've done a bunch of creative work, um, experimental blockchain work in this space since 2013. Um, I've built up a reputation as being a, a puzzle maker and hiding uh, private keys as Easter eggs and uh, numerous types of medium and uh, causing mayhem for fun, uh, which naturally just became a basically a community building type of work. I was recruited for uh, four projects like Decred. Um, and and from there, I uh, just escalated to making my own interactive projects, which then we launched the game company in January and um, had this big vision that we decided to go for. So, um, so yeah, that's, I think for the past 10 months, I've been working on Blockade Games and our first title, Neon District, um, which is a uh, blockchain game company. I am super excited about Neon District, and I've played with some of the stuff that you built. There was this wonderful AI experience that you guys created, and I have to admit, I, I tried it out and was completely flustered. Uh, but then apparently somebody put in the work and, and actually cracked a lot of it, uh, but it seemed like there was a really good community response. Did you did you see who solved it? Who solved it? I read a Medium post. Who solved it? Yeah, so the guy that wrote that Medium post was the senior game producer on Overwatch over at Blizzard. <laughs> See? No, it was really cool. Well, he's in our community too. So the weird thing was we found out that, um, so, okay, this is another weird thing. Uh, our Reddit, the person that runs our Reddit and has been in our community since forever, uh, since I was working on the Viacoin puzzle um, last year, he is the IT security guy at Blizzard like their main guy and he's in the top 20 uh hackers in the world according to hacker one and some other big uh of those big hacker uh challenge companies um and bug bounty so 
like I just it's weird you just turn around and you're like oh I have this incredible rock star in my community and so of course immediately I'm finding things for them to do <laughs> but um but yeah no it's really neat to have that kind of those puzzles attract um just some uh, some top-notch talent that they love breaking they love getting into weird rabbit hole type projects and, and contributing um for fun which is something that you don't see a lot of yeah, any that's that's how I got into Bitcoin back in the day in 2013 was because of that open community, open door policy. Come in, contribute, and earn your way into being a uh, you know earn your stripes, I guess. And that's how it worked for a lot of even the Bitcoin developers early on, right? It was a earn your stripes and and become somebody, contribute, uh, make this better. Um, in the art space of the blockchain space, it's kind of it's doing that same thing. Um, the community, the uh, blockchain community in general, the open source space has really evolved. I don't know how you feel about that, but I'm seeing this explosion of the art side. And then also the, now the indie game side also starting to take off. And it's just really exciting for me because I've been playing with this kind of content for a long time. And now I have a lot more friends to play with right before we were pretty, there was only a few of us. Yeah, it's definitely exploded. I would say every aspect of the space has exploded in the last couple of years. And I, I've i gone back and I've looked at some of your early work. I want to talk about your history with some of these pieces because I feel like, generally speaking, artists tend to be the creators and sustainers of cultural trends. And early on, Bitcoin wasn't really a cultural trend. It was still very much a niche community, an open community, like you said, but it was, it was very niche. So... When you were doing your early work, like when when you started out with all this stuff in 2013, uh, and maybe talk about specific pieces that you were doing, did did you think that art was going to play a role in in the growth of these technologies? And do, do you think it has? Um, so Andreas Antonopoulos uh, had said when I first was becoming part of the community, he had said something about uh, when there are artists, something along the lines of... Um, we're on our way to adoption when once we see artists like starting to pop up, right? Mm -hmm. They're usually there uh, blazing the trail next to everybody else, um, inspiring people around them and showing the vision, uh, which was, which was really inspiring. I think that, um, yeah, I really love Andreas, right? So um, yeah. anyways, what was it? <laughs> what was your question again? What someone, my first piece is, so uh, the dark wallet um, piece. Well, that was my very first puzzle. And it was a portrait of Cody Wilson and Amir Takai back when they were working on dark wallet, um, which was a privacy. It was supposed to be a wallet that gave you privacy, allowed Bitcoin to be more private. Mm. Uh, Back in the day. I don't actually know what ended up happening to that project. I know they just kind of um, teetered out some somewhere there in the two, 2014. But um, but yeah, so I took I thought this was really cool. I was like, oh, this is supposed to be a privacy painting. So it was actually in the middle of the, the painting that I was thinking, how can I um, do something fun and hidden in the art piece itself? You know, that with a uh, crypto. So, so yeah, I started playing and I loved, I think I was just learning about Cicada 3301 at the time as well. Um, and I had just read Ready Player One. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was, I was thinking, oh, let's, you know, a private key really is just a string of, um, of characters yeah. and, um, and, and you could hide information like that in lots of different ways. And I, I had seen that art piece of a, it's a digital art piece of a building that was showing binary in the windows, like the lights were animated in the windows. Um, and it was just showing binary. It wasn't actually anything meaningful. Um, and and it, that made me think like, well, why not make it meaningful? Why not uh, actually do something with bridging the the digital content together with um, information that is you know goes somewhere or is a mystery? And and you've I don't know if you followed any of the early game A or like alternate reality games. Um, sure. Like I Love Bees. Which, yeah. And, and yeah, those kind of games. So, I mean, those, those, of course, are amazing. Like, if you had someone call your phone uh, about with a puzzle clue, that would be unreal. I don't have that kind of a budget. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, just play. So that first piece, Dark Wallet, I just wanted to play with that idea a little bit. So we, um, it had, I don't remember how many levels it had, maybe, like, nine stages and level, uh, standalone levels. But you would get through the first level, uh, solve it, 
and then it would unlock the next gate, the next challenge for yourself. And it was never a clear cut thing. It wasn't designed to be that way. It was like a weird, um, I think I'm doing, you know, you wanted players to have this feeling of, I think I'm doing the right thing. And as a game designer, that made me have to try to guide them in leaving a uh, breadcrumb of clues across the internet, basically, um, for them to get from point A to point B. And uh, at one of the points we had a Minecraft server. So, and it was, it was basically all these players started loading the Minecraft server all at the same time. Someone discovered it and shared it. And then they all uh, came on and the Minecraft server reset every hour. And it was or the game the it would reset every hour. We had it loaded with puzzles everywhere uh, and traps and you couldn't break it apart. Uh, but you couldn't like, you know, modify the world. We had it set like that. Uh, and there were ender dragons flying around, <laughs> but um, you could uh, destroy things with the, the creepers. And, uh, and so they figured out, they worked together to figure out anyways, how to, how to get through that level. And it was hilarious. And the backlogs uh, were just hysterical. Oh, <laughs> so even yeah. then it was collaborative. Yeah. Right. And that was, I think one of the, things I learned immediately this was all very experimental for me I had no idea what I was doing I, we were always just also just building one or two levels ahead of everybody because we didn't we didn't really know what we were doing at the time um we were just trying to do something fun but what happened was it blew up on Bitcoin talk it became the most popular thread on Bitcoin talk ever wow. um during that time period I don't know if that's still true today but during that time and Bitcoin um, talk is a very different place now yeah, right. At least some of the yeah, sub forums. Yeah. yeah, and this was on the main page. This was on the main Bitcoin talk page. Mm -hmm. Um and it was just that number one, like number one spot there, just getting bumped and bumped over and over. Uh and uh for for I think it was like a, a two weeks, maybe, maybe three weeks. I can't remember it totally. I was that was in July or June June of twenty fourteen. And um but yeah, so we were just barely ahead of the players, right? We we weren't even sure if we could go to bed because they might be to the next phase and there'd be nothing there, right? right. <laughs> so they accidentally um, step into the void. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and we didn't want to make people mad, so we were just working really hard to just pull it off. Um, anyways, uh, that was so fun, and it, it and like you said, it was collaborative. I didn't know people. It showed me the social side of gaming really early on. Right. Um, the people love games and they love like the experience. They really want to share it with people. Um, yeah, I've, I did some, I've done some game design in my past. I took some game design courses when I was in graduate school. I read everything by people like Jane McGonigal, who just tried to make uh, a lot of this more accessible to, to people like understanding like game thinking and, and, and applying game design to everyday life. It's, it's really fascinating that it's becoming a field now. Uh, being able to take some of those aspects of games and like understand like what makes them so fun and engaging and how do we apply them to other fields? I don't even mean things like gamification where like everything comes with a badge or, you know, you can score points on some sort of like internal human resources board. I just mean like, like what makes something actually fun and engaging? What gets people to show up and commit so much of their time? Like these guys at Blizzard, what, what makes them show up and want to do this stuff? You know, it, you can't just, you can't just make it extrinsic rewards, right? Like people have to be really hooked by the core of what the puzzle is. And, and I think this is similar with Bitcoin, right? Like people weren't hooked by the fact that this thing could be worth thousands and millions of dollars. They were, they were hooked by the idea that it's like, here's this completely new way to do money or to store information, to, to transfer value. All, all of this was totally new. Like, like you said, nobody knew what they were doing. I'm still pretty sure that they don't. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the community, the community around uh, Bitcoin, like how strong it is and robust. Um, I, if you think about it, that's really, it's really interesting how um, community having community forces adoption. Right. Uh, obviously, you can't you can't have something adopted if there's nobody driving it forward. And why would people do it if they're not enjoying it? So. Uh, people congregated in the early days for the different products and wanted to work collaboratively to problem solve. Um, I think that was a lot of the love, you know, uh, did they love collaborating more with others on this really cool, weird distributed thing or, or did they just love the idea of money? Right. I don't think it was just the idea of decentralized money. Maybe, maybe it is, but I think 
that the hook of working together actually was maybe a little stronger than what people have given it credit for. Well, it's also that it's being built in in parallel, sort of a parallel universe, right? Like Bitcoin itself is sort of an augmented reality game in that it's constructing a completely new paradigm for money and value, you know, building as this weird alternate universe to the traditional space of banks and PayPal and everything else. And it's weird because in some ways things are being invented from scratch, but in another ways, now I'm seeing a lot of traditional businesses kind of trying to be ported onto uh, blockchain, like just sort of like these decentralized applications being built from scratch. And some of it seems kind of rushed. Some of it seems like you said that nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, some of it seems super visionary. Um, and, and I'm curious to see, uh, and we'll get into this when we talk a little bit more about like Neon District, but I'm curious to see what you think are like the decentralized applications that, that are that are really fascinating to you that you think will get a lot of adoption. Um, I have one question though, but before we get to things like that, um, I, I, my, my question that I asked that we sort of moved away from was whether like you thought artists played a large role in the growth of things like Bitcoin. And I know what Andreas said, which is awesome. And I totally agree. Um, so I have another question around the, the role of art here. Uh, I have an Oscar Wilde quote. You ready for this? Oh yeah. People sometimes inquire what form of government is most suitable for an artist to live under. To this question, there is only one answer. The form of government that is most suitable to the artist is no government at all. Authority over him and his art is ridiculous. So that's Oscar Wilde. Uh, mm -hmm. the, n probably not Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, but it's interesting. I, I've heard this a lot, sort of this, uh, that there's this anarchic streak to Bitcoin. I don't know if I believe that, but, but I'm curious, what do you, what do you think about uh, your ability to create art in this space? How, how does it differ from creating art uh, for the traditional world, or is there any difference? Um, I don't think there's, okay. So hmm, there's many facets to this question. <laughs> you have, um, the art world, right? Which, um, traditional modern artists, if you were to go back to the New York school of art, you had artists like, uh, Andy or not, not yet. Yeah, I guess Andy Warhol is postmodern. So, but you had, uh, Rothko right? And, and that school. And a lot of them, Rocco was an abstractionist, but you had others that really loved breaking down rules and mm -hmm. like making art according to a rule set. Um, and you still have this today. Our curators get obsessed with like, what is good art and what isn't good art? And does it check these boxes or doesn't it check these boxes? Um, the, so you get people in that kind of a box, I think, of thinking. And then you have the people that are just all about chaos, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they don't, I think that idea of tyranny, uh, versus freedom, chaos versus order, those are just like really two, um, themes that run in a, any field. So whenever you have artists that work to be passionate and, uh, pushing, I guess the boundary on just what you can do with distributed systems and decentralization and how can you use art to, uh, I guess, do new and creative things, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're going to also have artists push back and do something completely on the other end of the spectrum. So, um, but yeah, so in this space, I see people doing really neat things, for example, with augmented, the augmented reality. I've, I've seen some pieces on walls um, with tokens, tokenized assets that are also tied to augmented artworks and interacting with them in a virtual way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you saw the recent Banksy piece of the piece was purchased and then the that self shredding. Piece was yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, this idea of making things more interactive with art is I think uh, a place we're headed for sure. Um, defining art, art living in, in spaces that are in between um, the whole movement for Coda's art is really taking off. Yeah. Um, and, and like the idea that you can have tokenized art now. So that was one thing I was really passionate about early on. My, my buddy, Rob Meyer, Myers, who makes, he's been big into Coda's art since the day Ethereum rolled out. He, he was making, like playing with that uh, on the test net. <laughs> and so um, to see it now in a place where you can actually move uh, art, digital art and, and code as one encompassed piece uh, and transfer it, it's so cool because artists like that have never had a way to really monetize that. 
um, right? Like you don't just down, oh, yeah. it's not as exciting if you just download someone's build and and now you own it. That's not as exciting as it tra- being transferred to a wallet and it's in your wallet and you own it. And then now it's this interactive thing that syncs with some site or something like that. But yeah, uh, yeah living, so, living art, living art. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's, that's where you keep pushing that idea and that's where you get into games, right? That's where you get into right. uh, blockchain games is it's this idea of living art, living game assets. And, and getting into a very strange experimental world. Um, I don't want to know if you want me to jump all the way down there right now, but, um, but we'll yeah. Get, we'll get there. I want to I want to leave <laughs> it in chunks, right? Yeah. I, I'm sure we could, like I said, 10,000 things I could ask you, but it, but if we dump it all out at once, I, I feel like I, I feel like we're already like making a mess just like and jumping around in the words, which is what I love is like throw all the words in a pool and then we're just swimming in them because there's so much to say about this. Like I want to ask you if you consider... Bitcoin itself art, but that's such a big question that I kind of want to save it for the end. Okay. Uh, but I do want to pick up the one thing you said around uh, the application of these technologies to art, right? Because one of the ways that I first came into blockchain as a technology, um, as opposed to just Bitcoin itself, I discovered Bitcoin as a trader, right? I was an options trader before I went back to graduate school. But in graduate school, I got into blockchain because I thought it had applications in the music industry. And at the time, I was looking at what Imogen Heap was doing. I was looking at what Ujo was doing with trying to create this like full stack solution for the artist value chain for musical artists, where you would distribute payments, you know, based on who actually produced the piece and artists would have more control over their work. Uh, and you, and you could track streams so easily. And I remember thinking that it seemed like just so obvious. And then I did an entire semester's worth of work on whether it would actually ever occur. And the time frame I put on it was about two decades. Not because of the, just the tech, but because of the politics of the Songwriters Guild and the and the and how, how you pay out performance licenses versus recording licenses. And the whole thing was crazy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, I hear you on that. Well, IP and uh, co- for content creators is, is no joke. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I wanted to talk to you, like let let's leave music maybe aside, but let let's talk about things like non fungible tokens and, and the blockchain. Like, do you what do you see blockchain doing? Like, we've talked a little bit about what art has done for the blockchain world, so let's reverse it. What do you think blockchain is going to do for the art world? Well, like I just talked about a little bit with uh, Rob, right? Now you have a whole new set of art artists that can monetize and create things and 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 create virtual experiences that now they can get paid for their work or sell it or, um, or indie game developers, um, have an easier way to, to monetize. Mm -hmm. Um, but you still have to worry about distribution and and the platforms and exposure and user acquisition. And I mean, you know, you can't, it's so hard. You can't just make a good game, right? It's Mm -hmm. not that easy. Um, so anyways, what, what has, what has blockchain, done for, for art is that what yeah what has it what has it done and what will it do i mean I, we could say that it's you know you can tell me what you think it's done i also am curious what you think it will have done in the in the next let's say five years well blockchain is just a tool right like yeah it's 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 um it's just a way for people to basically have more control over their ownership um in one regard, uh, it also allows, it's supposed to allow for easy sharing of verifiable assets. So like you said, you could divide assets down into multiple owners, uh, one asset down into multiple owners, but I don't know. That's comp- Do people really want that? I don't know that they really want that. It's just kind of like- They're trying. I thought somebody just did that with a Warhol piece. Yeah. I just don't know that people actually want to do that. Like in the end, do you, do you, how many times have you ever taken or like been somewhere and purchased something with Bitcoin for convenience or some digital asset for convenience, right? Right. Not not recently, uh, barely at all. Yeah, you know, not really ever. <laughs> like, usually it's a planned thing. Like you're like, oh, I know I'm going to want to buy this thing with Bitcoin. I better have it on my phone. I better, like you've made all these measures to, you usually don't have a bunch of Bitcoin laying around on your mobile phone or right. <laughs> at least you shouldn't. <laughs> um so so anyways um i i don't think it's convenient yet um i think that right now it allows a lot of it's supposed to be just another back end uh solution for achieving 
some sort of goal. So like for, for me, I think about it, how does it help with socializing uh, an economy? I see that as a pretty uh, clear way for a reason to use a blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I think that I'm not sure that blockchain directly impacts art yet. I guess I have to think about that a little more. What do you think? Maybe if you tell me what you think, I'll think about this. <laughs> well, that's cheating, isn't it? <laughs> well, I like what you're saying about this idea of, you know, ownership. And, and I think something that you're getting at a lot is this idea of accessibility uh, and democratization, which is a couple things uh, that Richard said in his interview, Richard from Numerai. And Numerai, they talk a lot about like the democratization of finance. And they they think that, you know, the way that they're building things, uh, it's going to dramatically open up. Joey said the same thing about Augur. Uh, it, it's going to open up participation in the financial space. I, I wonder, you know, blockchain might be able to make art ownership more accessible. And that, that would be one thing. But I don't, I don't care so much about art ownership. I care much more about like art creation. And what you've been telling me about communities, right? And I'm more interested in how it will sustain, maybe I'm biased because this is my job, but I'm more interested in how blockchain is going to sustain the growth of new communities, how it's going to be an incentive structure that creates new types of organizations that keep people collaborating in a way that they might not otherwise. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you're gonna. That's where I'm talking about, like the experimentation that's gonna happen in indie games and the crossover of blockchain, um, because you're gonna see a lot of, you know, games are art, so much art, music, graphics, um, and you can gamify a lot of things. So, I think you're gonna see DApps that are heavily gamified with blockchain in the way that, uh, let's say, you do a treasure hunt around the world, right, and then you want to do graffiti, virtual graffiti on walls, but yet it's a kind of something you only see through an app finder, viewfinder or something like that. Um, tokens that you can, and they have a token and maybe you can take that off the wall and maybe you could put it up somewhere else. I mean, there's things you can do. I just don't know. It's going to be neat. Like if you do things like that, that's going to be really neat. I think it sounds awesome. <laughs> but, but like, I just, I think um, you're good. So blockchain will give like the Pokemon experience that, that can be played with in numerous ways. Uh, globally, uh, but you, you can dress that up, you know what I mean, and multiple themes and give it different kind of game mechanics or game design. Um, but but I don't know that it really does anything new per se, right? Because you could do a lot of that still just through through um, what it does do is it does surpass the people's ability to create value. Uh, mm -hmm. through a vehicle, like if you're using game mechanics, like as a vehicle to derive value, um, and then to exchange that for your first uh, crypto, like your first Ethereum, then you've, you've done something, I think, really valuable. But other than that, I'm not sure, like be, allowing people to tap into real world ec economic value is huge. Other than that, I don't think it changes anything that's been done before. Because game you know what I mean? Like in, in games, you can do a lot of that just through a centralized server you know, people could have game assets uh, globally. And, but the difference here is allowing people to walk away with it as theirs and being able to do something with it, take it elsewhere or exchange it for something valuable. Um, yeah. So, I think, I think it's an unavoidable trend just given how the digital world and the physical world have merged that people are going to have like people growing up now, let's say like, children growing up now who didn't, you know, experience the 80s, didn't experience the 90s, uh, but have experienced this like, you know, totally immersive digital lifestyle that they have. It's like, why is something that I'm doing in this game world not carrying over into the physical world and back again? Like, why haven't they coincided more? And if the barrier is technical, like blockchain can only solve so much of that, right? A lot of it is also just in the in the way that all of these universes are connected. Uh, but I do think that, as you said, as it relates to value, that's, that is really interesting. And maybe games are an onboarding ramp into the crypto economy. Uh, right. That's, that's what I see. That makes total sense to me. So I, I ask all of our guests what they think the first decentralized applications to get millions of users or adopters is going to be. 
And unsurprisingly, when I asked Joey Krug, he said it would be probably something like Augur, maybe a decentralized prediction market. Um, I feel like if I ask you that, you're going to say it's going to be a game. <laughs> well, I think if you look at digital uh, economies historically, I mean, where have they existed before they were in games? Um, so I, th I think the most natural fit here is games. I've thought that this always, um, it's something people are familiar with. Uh, it's, it's just like when you teach people how to play a game, uh, you don't want to do something necessarily so weird and different. Nobody knows how to play it. Right. You usually want to use things people are familiar with and just iterating on top of that with something unique, that's slightly unique. And I think that's what virtual currencies are they're just the next iteration of a digital economy uh it's just decentralized so how you access that uh doesn't have to be as hard as it has is currently right how you get to that our virtual item doesn't have to be so difficult you don't i think being able to bypass having a bank like for example uh, it doesn't do us any favors if you have to have a bank account in order to buy crypto right with yeah. a lot of the exchanges require you have to have a bank account. Um, so, so being able to um, get achieve having virtual currencies in other ways, other means is, is really important for mass adoption. Um, That's a really critical point. And actually that is similar to something Joey also said, which is he thought one of the biggest barriers to adoption of decentralized technologies was actually the fiat on ramp. The fact that it's so hard to turn our, classical US dollars, Korean won, whatever, in, into these crypto assets. And he thought that was a huge blocker. I hear you suggesting something different, which is like, don't don't bother building that bridge. Give people another way to turn their time, turn their contributions, turn their ability to form communities into uh, a digital native currency or some sort of digitally native asset. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to do both, right? You're going to have to have the on-ramping to make like, that. You have to have the fiat on-ramping also. Uh, but if you can have the other means for people to turn time or skill into money, uh, virtual money, and they're not bound by a bank account, then we're really starting to achieve something with our distributed network, uh, surpassing the barriers that we have uh, with traditional banking. So let's talk about where you are today, right? We've talked a bit about the history, talk a bit about the vision. Let's go back to the present day. Tell me what you're working on right now with, with Neon District and some of these other projects. What is it, first of all, and then why why this, why now? So Neon District is an attempt to do a lot of the things we've been talking about, right? It's a, it's a cyberpunk RPG. It's very heavy on art, uh, both uh, aesthetically and visual, uh, so visually, and then also with uh, the music. And we're trying to uh, basically build a universe with a with a very strong brand um, that players can, if you're familiar with CryptoKitties with a non fungible token, and they had their their breeding. Uh, basically, Neon District is a way to build game mechanics that give people that all at the same starting point, <clears throat> both characters, uh, materials. Uh, the ability to evolve uh, any of those game assets into something that is unique and valuable. The more you play with it, the more it becomes unique. And then um, and be able to go trade it on a peer-to-peer marketplace or enter a new game. Or um, So we have partners that we're working with in that way to do cross-game crafting, cross-game questing, um, ways that a story can continue after end game of one game to do like an inception experience of waking up in a new game. Um, it's very heavy on the collaboration side, which is perfect for our open source space uh, that attracts people that really that's, you know, we love working together and building new weird things. Um, but also Neon District's goal is to be a very, so it's a front facing traditional indie game and it will feel that way and it will play that way. And the back end will, be um, blockchain and a hybrid game server, uh, but the user experience will feel seamless. It won't feel like there's any blockchain barriers. Um, you can on-ramp with USD fiat uh, through the game because you, you because you can buy non-fungible tokens that way. You don't have, with fun, fungible tokens, you have a lot of barriers about where your application can live. It can't, it can't be in the app, app store. It can't be on Steam, uh, but non-fungible tokens, they don't have that. 
So we've made a point to not have an ICO, not have a fungible token, um, so that your game assets, uh, yeah, can have the op- so basically our goal is to have mass adoption of crypto, right? Get Ethereum um, into as many people's hands as possible. And you might have a lot of people that frown about, oh, but it's Ethereum, but it's just crypto. Like you just put crypto in people's hands and they can go trade that for, for value or something. It, that, that is a huge um, hook for, for people that have never experienced virtual currency before. Um, so, so yeah, I guess, But you're not marketing, and this is what's so great, right? Like, you're telling me, like, this is going to feel on its face like a traditional game. I mean, obviously an awesome and weird game, but a traditional game in that you don't, uh, you're you're not submitting transactions directly to a blockchain and that's the game, right? And people aren't going to play it just because it's a way to accumulate Ethereum. They're playing it because it's a game, an actual engaging collaborative game that feels like something familiar. Right. Exactly. Um, and we are designing with our own, our game design trying to be fun and unique. Um, like you said, designing fun is its own challenge. So spent lots of time on that. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, the basically the blockchain in this is not a gimmick. It's supposed to be just a feature that players may grow to be accustomed to. And, and it might be something that like, oh, I like how this is. I like that I can do these things. And I wasn't able to do this before. Um, when I talk about the cross game questing and crafting, that is, that's a niche thing, right? That will feel more like an Easter egg or something that appeals to uh, the hardcore user, right? You you probably won't be pushing that too much in people's face uh, with the mainstream market, but but you you can teach them, you can teach gamers a little bit about what what they can do, and they'll start learning like how did that person get that cool thing, or um, yeah, I guess, and the uh, another idea our thing that we're working on with Neon District is the idea that artists, third-party art markets and also third-party development markets. Um, So we've designed character rigs. Uh, Basically, uh, so we're using spine animation, 2D spine animation. This means that a lot of digital painters can come in and uh, skin these, these rigs and then sell their own limited number of these character skins and monetize that themselves and be paid for their paintings for, um, and then we can plug and play that into the game. So That's super cool. Yeah. And I really like that as an artist because, because I, it's so hard as a digital artist or just an artist in general to get out there and for people. So if we are making a game that's about val- that the game itself has the users and players and people that where unique items are um, hot commodities, then that gives artists a huge opportunity to make uh things to stand out in the game right so we right. have we would have submission guidelines and whatnot but anyways that's something i'm really excited about and in the same uh, vein you have the development uh third-party development so you know how gamers love to make mods oh, yes. um so yeah we've we've designed this with pipelines in which to support third third-party development so the game mechanics and the design um you can choose as a developer some different rule sets for a quest you want to design. You can have uh, put your own drop, like loot drops on that quest. And then along the way on that quest, if uh, players fall or lose items, whatever, you can monetize by collecting those things yourself as the developer. And then maybe someone in the end gets your loot, your treasure box, but maybe yeah. you've made more, made more money than lost. Um yeah, I what I found is that people love making, for example, in my puzzle making community people just love to do this. They love to make challenges and see how everybody fares, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's like a, um, who's playing Game Master, right? <laughs> so uh, people like to take turns playing Game Master and and being the storyteller. Um, and I, I love the idea that this game has that opportunity to become more than a game, but become a platform because that's how we've designed it to sustain that. Um, yeah, so that gives not only the economy of, creating value through gameplay itself and developing unique assets, but then allowing creators on both sides to participate. And then it's sustaining the entire, uh, eco- the, the whole ecosystem gets more robust. There's so much to like about the model, just in terms of like the growth perspective, because you know that the people who are playing this game the most are also going to be the people who are creating the assets for this game. So you've already got a two-sided marketplace for these assets just from 
having the the committed gamer user base, there's so much overlap with the committed artist user base. Uh, you, you're building such a strong core right off the bat. And as you said, by making it extensible, you know, it's very much like any of these protocol level projects uh, wh- where they want people to extend the capabilities that they've built, right? Like this is something we do at Enigma. We want people to extend the potential of privacy preserving smart contracts. There's so much you can do uh, as, as long as you have that capability. And there's so much that you can do if you've just got something like Neon Districts in, in front of you and, and you're working with an extremely creative audience. I'm super excited to see what they're able to do with it. And you're and you're just really starting out. Like, How long have you been working on this now? Uh, since January. So, man, it doesn't feel like we just started out. <laughs> we have been working on this pretty hard. For in a the while. grand scheme of things. <laughs> Yeah, but you well, know, think how long I, something like Overwatch stays in development, right? Oh yeah, no, for sure. Um, well, and another thing, I just like Enigma, like we're not building directly on, uh, we're not Ethereum mainnet either. We're a sidechain, right. um, and we're using a lot of the scaling solutions and uh, working with thinking about Plasma Cash, um, working with Loom and their Plasma Cash R and D, um. Think, thinking about, oh, we're developing with the smart contracts for uh, with 1155 and 998. We're taking pieces of different development that's been going on and customizing it for our game, um, but also contributing back to the open source community because it's really important that these games share standards if you want them to work together, right? And have, right. I, we probably won't have this all figured out in the beginning, but later, eventually, I think we're all going to figure out uh <laughs> Maybe at least some scenarios in which having multiple games working together interoperably makes sense. Uh, that's probably going to take some time, but but yeah, I, like the so you hear people a lot of times when you're like they hear blockchain game, they you hear them immediately start shouting about, well, that's never going to work. Blockchains aren't made for games, you know, because they're thinking about games on the main. And they're not even thinking about hybrid solutions and why that makes sense for games or. I just, I, I, we're going to get a lot of pushback by a lot of people, both on the blockchain side and the game side. So our, what we found is actually hiding the blockchain as much as possible <laughs> like just and, and just presenting ourselves as a game. But the community knows, and you have the opportunity then to interact with this really beautiful game that's compelling. And then it, it actually acts like a doorway to just fall down the rabbit hole that, you know, and you get to go as deep as you want to go. Um, that's how we're thinking about it and approaching it right now, because there's no point in pushing people too far if they don't want to go there. Um, yeah. So, but if they do, yeah, they, that's there. super exciting. Right. And then you can start cultivating and nurturing that sort of creativity and collaboration without forcing it down everybody's throat. They can have the opportunity to start experimenting and it not be threatening. That's where gamers, like they don't like blockchain because it's, I think what the world thinks of blockchain right now is a bad user experience. And they're, and they're probably, I mean, you know, games are hard to uh, onboard to sometimes because they're a little complex and you have to learn all these systems. And then if you say, and blockchain, then that's like, well, you know, nobody wants to figure that out. <laughs> like, so you have to teach people how to play the game, make it fun, uh, and then make it really cool to want to trade assets, uh, not be a gimmick. Because if you make it a gimmick, gamers are going to hate you and you'll never be respected. Um, so, you're, yeah, it's a very fine line to walk. I agree. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how the experience actually is. And, and, of course, playing it myself as soon as I find all that free time that's been lying around. Uh, but I can always make time for the, something like this. I think it's going to take a community to come in and, and people that w- like we're building. It's going to take a lot of people playing with it uh, to figure out what's working, what's not working. And and probably us being in a private beta for, for a, probably a little longer than we want to be to figure out a lot of these. Um, like, is that fun? Is, is this not fun? Is this a bad experience sort of thing, right? We yeah. have to do a lot of focus groups and um but this stuff's hard work it is hard work making a game by itself is hard i mean that's what that's where you get so much cynicism is um game developers know how hard it is to make a a game and then make a good game is that much harder and now you want to put blockchain into it like you just people just write you off um so i don't know i was inspired recently by um 
so the the CEO of CCP, which is uh, so CCP is the company behind Eve Online. I met him at this last conference, uh, the Blockchain Game Summit, and he it was incredible. I didn't know who he was, right? He was this tall, redheaded guy um, from Iceland. <laughs> and nice. I was just chatting with him and, he, and he's a big uh, digital currency enthusiast um, is, is how he, how he described himself. Anyways, I don't know if you know much about Eve, but it has a really robust game economy. Um, and he told me the backstory of Eve. It was 30 people that never had, uh, never made a game. And they wanted to make this really ambitious space game. And everybody told them that they were crazy. You know, who are you? Uh, you you want to compete with EA? You're nuts. Anyways, took them three years and they worked about 80 hour weeks and then they had a really rough, rocky start. Um, but in the end, if you, anyone thinks of EVE Online, I don't think you think of it as a failure, right? <laughs> That's not exactly what comes to mind. You think of a giant success. And I had no idea about the backstory about EVE. To me, it was when I saw it um, first come out, it was one of the most beautiful games I had ever seen. And I can't believe it was made by th 30 people that didn't have any game experience, a game development experience. Um, previously. So that was really inspiring uh, to hear that you can have a vision and and go for something, right? And you don't always need permission from people to do it. You should just, yeah. if you have a vision and something you're passionate about, you should just go for it and and do your best. And if you get a bunch of crap for it, I mean, who cares? That is the call to action I've heard for artists for so long, where it's like, what are you going to do? Something else? It's like, no. <laughs> It's like that that's not even an option at the end of the day. You you have to do the thing that you think you're supposed to be doing. And to take this full circle and to get to our final question, uh that's kind of where this whole Bitcoin thing came from, you know? Like no d there wasn't really anybody, certainly not the banks, who gave anybody permission to create this new type of weird internet money. And and here we are. You know, there've been some growing pains. I I think at this point, nobody would call Bitcoin a failure except those like, I think, 200 or so articles that have declared it dead over the past decade. And <laughs> and who knows? We'll probably get 200 more. But the point is that this crazy, weird experiment seems to be going okay, all things considered. And it's certainly gotten a lot of really talented, really visionary people involved with questions that we didn't even know we'd be able to start tackling that, that, we, that we never thought would apply. So I guess my question, which I said earlier and I want to close on, is, is Bitcoin itself art, right? You, are the people building it and, and sustaining that network artists? Uh, I, read, I read something on the valuation side, too, that the best way to value Bitcoin and, and thinking about it, like for the people who think it's like internet gold, is that like, could you value it like a piece of fine art in that it is, you know, it's limited supply. It's not everywhere. There's only so many Bitcoin ever going to be created. Maybe we should be valuing it like a Picasso instead of like some sort of traditional cash flow asset. I don't just mean like how do we value Bitcoin. I mean, should we see it as something artistic in nature? Wasn't it Switzerland that tried to define Bitcoin as art a while ago? I, I want to believe that's true and I will Google it right after we're done because okay. that sounds really cool. I think I'm pretty sure it was like back in 2014. They at least that conversation existed at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, so if you want to break down what is art, I mean, that's a really on its own just a giant question, right? So then, if you want to say, well, is Bitcoin art? I don't. Um, Let me be clear I, and say that I don't want the right answer. I just. I <laughs> If if you're searching for that first gut feeling about like when you look at Bitcoin, I know Bitcoin is a lot of other things. I know a lot of other things are art, but just like how, how can we think about it? Like is is that remotely accurate? No, I think so. I think of Bitcoin as a tool and a system, and I think that the art is something that lives on a layer too. It's something that's intangible that is that can't be quantified, right? It's an art is like an emotional, emotive. Uh, almost, you know, sort of intangible thing. And I mean, if you want to say like, as far as like, okay, well, painting is tangible and, uh, and that's art, but is it, the, is that true? Or is it your experience of perceiving the painting and what the painting is and the object that is actually the art in the artistic moment? Or is it actually the fine art painting and the picture of, you know, of the paint down on the canvas? Like, I, I think, um, 
because in in that way, I don't know, like if you want to say it's a distributed collaborative project to create like an ant hill, right? I could see the argument for that maybe. <laughs> like a yeah. A, um but I I I kind of see Bitcoin being more of the infrastructure to support uh artistic experiences on top of it more than I see it as being but maybe I, I guess I'd see it more as a canvas than I would but, but it's true it's a big giant experiment so I, I don't know I think you're right in that that's a really hard question hard thing to define um much like art I, yeah <laughs> um so you know you know that I think that humanity is always the thing that brings um art to life and at the same time humanity isn't that kind of the thing that's screwing up some of the decentralized processes with bitcoin that we were hoping for uh, in that there's always like at one day who's in charge of the code base like pushing the code um so i don't know um i think i think the focus on humanity is really important and i think that art having a human focus and everything you're saying about wanting these decentralized technologies to eventually, you know, fall into human hands, whether we know we're interacting with a blockchain or not, at a certain point, we are the end users and we want that technology to work for us and we want it to create value for us and we want it to be a tool that makes us feel the way that we want to feel. And if it makes us feel good to collaborate with others and we're creating new types of experiences and new types of platforms that make new types of collaboration possible then I think that blockchain is a very powerful tool for humanity. And whether it gets... It, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it can be used against humanity too, though, right? Um, oh, yes. So so I, I think there's a fine line there where... That's kind of what Neon Search Storyline is about. It's a, it's, it's a little bit of a blockchain gone wrong uh, dystopian future um, to kind of present that idea that blockchain really is a tool and it, it in itself... Like Bitcoin in and of itself, uh, it, it requires human decision making to make sure it's, it still steers in the right direction. Um, you could have a privatized blockchain that launches. And it, so it, it's very clear that blockchain itself is not just a solution that everyone should be excited about, right? <laughs> because that could be, if you think about a ledger that can't be edited, um, that's in the wrong hands and documenting a lot of personal information. Uh, you very quickly have a very bad scenario. I don't think that we're in a situation that this would happen anytime soon. Right. But I mean, if, pe if people are data mining and collecting information without us knowing it, and then it's being tracked in ways that we wouldn't be approving, like approve of, it could, what if it happened without your knowledge? Um, yep. Yeah, you, know, you know how we feel about data privacy over at Enigma. <laughs> You, exactly. Well, and then what if you introduce, like, apparently Elon Musk thinks that AI is just on its way. So now let's combine all those ideas together and think about how quickly this could just go really bad. And oh, that's yeah. kind of the premise of our game. <laughs> so. That is such a great place, I think, to leave the conversation because now I really want to play it. And it's so fascinating <laughs> that it, it's a game that's that's partially built on on blockchain and the and these futuristic ideas and, and and all of these things we've talked about in this conversation and yet at the same time the game itself is cautioning us about how these ideas can be applied and i look forward to the cognitive dissonance of, <laughs> of experiencing neon district for myself well it was so lovely to have you on the show i really appreciate you taking the time to explain everything about your work and your vision for this future if anybody wants to learn more about you or about Neon District, is there somewhere they can go and read or learn more? Yeah, sure. So um, I think our Discord is is probably a most active community. Our uh, site, neondistrict.io, has links to all of our social. Um, awesome. And then, of course, my account, uh, coin underscore artist on Twitter, I'm pretty active there. And the uh, Neon District Twitter is pretty active too. So we, we haven't yet released all of our you know content publicly. So um, we're still pretty stealth about what we're doing and enjoying our opportunity to um, iterative prototyping and whatnot, right? In until we have to answer to people. So, awesome. but in the future, in the future, we'll put out content to share um, and get some critical feedback. But yeah, thank you so much for having me.
Absolutely. I'll put all those links in the episode description. Anybody listening can feel free to follow those and learn more about these projects. But Marguerite, thank you so much for joining me. uh, And I hope we talk again soon. All right. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more about Enigma, you can visit us at www.enigma.co. You can go to our blog at blog.enigma.co. You can join our Telegram group at t.me slash Enigma Project. Uh, If you're curious about anything we talked about in the podcast today, make sure you follow the links below in the episode description. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Medium so you don't miss our next awesome episode and interview. Otherwise, thank you for listening. We hope to see you next time on Decentralize This. I'm Tor Bear. Have a great day.